Hello everyone, welcome back to 27201 and to this lecture on Graptolite. I'm speaking to you today from an autumnal but fairly sunny, quite nice Manchester. And I'm going to be covering in this video, as per, I'm sure you've recognised the uh, pattern by now, um, an introduction to and the biology of the Graptolites. So uh, before I started, I'll start, I just wanted to highlight that actually this image, I really like this image that I've got as my uh, title slide, as we'll discover later, is, a, um, is an image showing examples of incorrect modes of life for the Graptolites. So do bear that in mind, um, don't read too much into it, it's just the only pretty image that I could find to show Graptolites and I really liked it, so I included it. So with that caveat and warning, let us go on and let us look at the introduction and biology of the Graptolites. So Graptolites are hemichordates, right? So I realize that that's completely useless as a definition to you if you don't know what a hemichordate is. So actually, rather than asking my normal, what is a Graptolite, I'm going to start this video by asking what is a hemichordate? So the hemichordates are a small phylum of around 120 living species. They're generally small, soft-bodied animals that have bilateral symmetry and lack segmentation. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the basics of what they are. They're characterized by a rod-like structure that members of this group have called the stoma cord. The phylum actually contains two very different subgroups. The first um, are larger individuals. Uh, they're informal animals called the acorn or the tongue worms. They live in burrows and mainly in subtitle environments. And you can see some examples of these acorn worms on the left of the left-hand image here. The second uh, major grouping of uh, hemichordates are tiny. They're mainly colonial and they're called the terebranchs. So you can see the, um, the word terebranchia naming this clade here on the evolutionary tree on the right. So it's got a silent P at the beginning. Uh, blame the ancient Greeks for that one. But the pteropranks are the second group of hemichordates. And these are the relationships between our groupings. And today we're going to be spending all of our time, give or take, up in this clade here, the Graptolithina. So that's a very quick overview of um, the major groupings of hemichordates. And I wanted to highlight that hemichordates are a bit unusual in terms of their morphology. They're one of those things that if you saw in a horror movie, you'd probably think were completely made up and something that unrealistic could never survive. Sorry, there's, a, there's an ambulance going past outside. So I'll just let that pass. So I wanted to quickly give an introduction to this group, the hemichordates, before diving further into the Graptolites in terms of their biology as well. So I'll focus on the terebranchs, uh, this, this group of small colonial creatures that live on the seafloor. Uh, mem modern members of this hemichordate group are all colonial, um, and they're colonies that are made up of individual zooids. Zooids is just a word for an individual one of the animals that contribute to this colony. So they're colonial creatures and they feed with tentaculate ciliated arms. So you, they, you can see an example of this labeled on this image here, on the left here, what I mean by um, tentaculate ciliated. Basically these are arms with bits coming off that help them uh, grab their food. Living genera, uh, members of this group, have been used as analogues for many aspects of Graptolite morphology, ontogeny, so that's their development, and their paleoecology, hence me mentioning them here. So these animals, these living hemichordates, have a, a housing for their colony uh, made of something called fusella tissue, so it's a specific type of tissue. Uh, there is, within the colony, an organic system connecting the individual zooids, the animals. So this is called the stolon system. So it's just a system by which all of these individuals in a colony are linked to each other. Raptoploids, and you can see an example of an individual here and of a larger colony here, are first known from the Middle Cambrian. They occur in oceans today from the shoreline to depths of a few thousand meters. So these little creatures are still around. 
The colony hosts a series of organic walled tubes, and each of those tubes contains a zooid, so that's one of our animals here, with this specialised feeding organ made of a pair of arms. And those zooids are budded from this stolon system that joins all of the um, all of the individuals in the colony. And individuals are attached to the stolon by a thing called a zooidal stalk. So, as you can see, that's a fairly um, to us, I guess, weird um, biology. I certainly it doesn't come naturally to me as like, oh yeah, that's a thing that a way that creatures live their life. But here they are. They're a modern day example. So that is the hemichordates right there, and I wanted to then use that as a springboard to introducing the graptolites, or a member of the group, the graptolithina. These are generally stick-like fossils, and they're very common in many lower Paleozoic black shales in particular. So they're a really abundant fossil group. They were particularly abundant in the ancient seas of the early Paleozoic, um, where they will normally occur in those black shells that I've mentioned as flattened carbonized films. Things that you can see are on these images here, right? So they're very, very flat and you know, they look a bit like writing on the rock. And in fact, that's the origin of the name Graptolite. Graptolite means stone writing in Greek. And they, these were so named because they look like hieroglyphics. So from this great success early in the Paleozoic, uh, the grapholites have gone on to struggle a little bit. Had I given this lecture 10 years ago, in fact, I'd just be telling you flat out, this is a group that is extinct now. But in the last decade, some phylogenetic analyses have suggested that this group that I've already introduced, these living pterobranchs, the Radiplora, those, those tube-like colonies, could in fact be actual graptolites. So bear that in mind. Um, there is, we're in a state of flux when it comes to our, our view on graptolites at the moment. The lifestyles of fossil graptolites are somewhat difficult to interpret, so I would take much of what I say regarding how they live their lives with a pinch of salt, i.e. you don't need to pay um, too much uh, attention, I guess, to the exact details, because a lot of the time we don't really know. There's a great deal of uncertainty. The affinities of the graptolites as a whole were largely unknown until the 1940s. So by affinities, I mean their evolutionary relationships. But in the 1940s, there was a Polish paleontologist named Roman Kozlowski, who worked on this group and managed to um, discover through macerating, so um, removing via the uh, dissolution of the host rock in acid, complete unflattened specimens. Um, so he extracted these specimens from limestones using acid to dissolve the rock and those allowed him to identify the stolon system which then placed this um, group of previously kind of enigmatic um, fossils um, into the hemichordates. Uh, so there are, there are several groups of graptolites which I'll be introducing in video too. Naturally, at this point in the lecture, we're going to look very quickly at where these creatures sit on our tree of life. So in terms of the phylogenetic position of the hemichordates as a whole, this has long been debated because of their mixture of characters. If you read some old textbooks, you may find them uh, grouped amongst the lophophorates. So um, these are creatures within the lophotrochozoa. Um, or you may find them close to the echinoderms or as um, early members of the chordates. All of these have been suggested. Today, we can say, using both the morphology of the animals and their DNA, that we're fairly sure that the hemichordates are a sister group, so most closely related to the echinoderms, falling, forming a clade called the ambulacraria. Okay, so you can see them marked on, the hemichordates marked on a sister group to the echinoderms here within the deuterostomes. So this clade, the ambulacraria, forms this clade, the deuterostomes, along with the chordates. Hemichordates, though, unlike chordates, don't possess a notochord at any stage, but they share with chordates the possession of gill slits and giant nerve cells in some parts of their nervous system that may be equivalent to things that we see in um, some of the earliest branching chordates that are still alive. 
So that is where we sit in terms of the phylogeny of this group. It was a mystery. We're now fairly sure that A, graptolites are hemichordates, and B, the hemichordates are sister group to the echinoderms. As with many of the things that I've already mentioned, the um, taxonomy of this group um, is also in a state of flux. We can see fairly happily that they're animals, they're in the phylum hemichordata, and we're fairly sure nowadays they're in the class Terebranchia. Right, so that's what we've covered already. Um, there is a subclass of the Terebranchia, and this subclass is called Graptolithina, and those are the Graptolites. And this is split into seven orders in traditional schemes. So older textbooks up till the last 10 years will have seven uh, orders within the Graptolithina. This was rationalized by an author called Mallets in 2014, who suggested it should be split into just two orders, the order Dendroidia and the order Graptoloidia. So I'll be introducing those in more detail um, in the next video, and I will also be mentioning them in passing in the next slide, or in the coming slides, I should say. Arguments are still ongoing regarding the number of um, elements in the classification within this group, but this paper from 2014 is a, a very strong overview of where we currently stand if you want to read some more about it. The hemichordates as a whole have a long geological history, so we've got some early records of uh, hemichordates from the Middle Cambrian, um, so that's quite early in the um, uh, Paleozoic. Um, and so what we're looking at is a, a middle Cambrian origin for this group as a whole. Uh, Dendroid graptolites, this, uh, one of the two main groups that I've mentioned, appear also around the middle Cambrian and survive through to the middle Carboniferous. And the order Graptoloidia, um, so this is the second major grouping, also appear around the middle Cambrian and they survive until the middle Carboniferous in terms of what we say about their fossil record. However, if you accept that they are still alive today and these, this group, the Rhabdopleuridae, are modern examples of um, Graptolites, then obviously the group as a whole must still be alive today. Hence this dashed line where I didn't really want to commit to anything on the right of this graph here. Either way, by just eyeballing this graph, we can say that these creatures were incredibly successful and they're very useful in the earliest parts of the Paleozoic, so especially in the Ordovician and the Silurian. And then their usefulness for us as geologists kind of tails off as we go through the Devonian to the point where in the Carboniferous, they're fairly useless to everyone, really. A bit harsh, but you know, it's true. Um, and so they may be surviving today, but they're definitely not very successful and nowhere near as successful as they have been in the geological past. So as I've mentioned, in recent years, um, this group that's shown on the right here, the Rhabdoploids, have been identified as either closely related to or members of the Graptolites as a whole. These are remarkable little animals, so the Cambrian forms are virtually identical to modern examples, such as those ones that you show on the right. Um, this means that we can say with confidence that um, whatever happens, the Graptolites have their origins in the Cambrian, and Raptoplorids may well be um, benthic examples of the Graptolites. So these are just little erect, unbranched tubes that grow from a, a main tube um, on the seafloor today, and they did exactly the same thing back in the Cambrian period. So a common ancestor to uh, the Graptolites was thus probably, we think, a worm-like animal equipped with arms and tentacles. It may have lived in pseudo-colonial filter-feeding clumps on the sea floor, based on this group that was around quite early on in the uh, Cambrian period. And over the course of the Cambrian, if we look at the Graptolites as a whole, we can say that these kind of um, creeping colonies on the sea floor gave way to more erect structures. These were um, essentially just changes in the housing for the zooids and the colony shape that occurred as the group evolved. So early on, we see a large variety in dendroid forms of Graptolite. We'll cover this fully and how those differ from Graptoloid forms in the next video. But for now, just bear in mind that it means tree-like, multi-branched colonies. Those were still benthic. And by the late Cambrian, the diversity of these particular tree-like 
um, Graptolite, had markedly increased. Those species generally resembled small shrubs and were attached to the substrate by holdfasts. Don't let that confuse you and make you think they were um, not animals. Um, uh, shrubs is merely a functional comparison. These are animals, not plants. Yeah, so I'm just saying they're shrub-like in that they look like small shrubs. Um, they're actually animals. During the late Cambrian and into the early Ordovician, some dendroid um, graptolites make the jump from being sessile, benthic organisms, so organisms that live on the seafloor without moving around, uh, into the plankton. So they, they went from being um, attached and not moving on the seafloor to floating in the water column. And this obviously gave rise to the first planktonic genera. And then we start seeing graptoloids, which have fewer branches, um, which were planktonic. These evolved into a wide range of different forms and went on to dominate the group from the Ordovician. The vast majority of these are our graptoloid graptolites. So these are the, the planktonic forms. And we'll be looking more at those in the next video when we meet the graptolites in a bit more detail and get to know their morphology better. So I'll see you there in just a second.